Hey folks, welcome to our first video graphics card review, that of the AMD Radeon 7. So the idea behind these reviews is we're going to do a bit more streamlined approach than you'd get on the website. Over there you're going to get all the technical information, all of the results one by one, whereas here we're going to pick out the best parts, the most relevant parts. Uh, but we're open to playing with the format, so if you've got any feedback, let us know. And with that said, on with the review. So, the AMD Radeon 7. It's their new flagship card launching for $700, which puts it in line with the RTX 2080 from Nvidia. Now, this is similar to the previous generation. You may remember that the Vega 64, the previous AMD flagship, uh, was only targeting GTX 1080 performance rather than 1080 Ti. So that's going to be similar now. We, we, the Radeon 7 won't be targeting 2080 Ti performance. With the previous generation as well, you may remember that Vega 64 was notorious for being pretty hot, loud and so on. So we're hoping not to see the same thing from the Radeon 7, uh, but we'll get to that a bit later. Now in terms of specifications, the first thing to point out is that the Radeon 7 is not using AMD's Navi architecture. That isn't due for some time yet. This is Vega second generation, as they're calling it, which means it's based on the Graphics Core Next or GCN fifth gen. And that all gets a little confusing, but if you head over to the website, we'll, we'll clarify it all for you. So the GPU itself is the Vega 20, which is the seven nanometer iteration of Vega 10, which was used in the Vega 56 and Vega 64 cards. Now Vega 20 we have actually seen before, but not in the gaming space. It's been used in the Radeon Instinct MI60 and Radeon Instinct MI50 cards. These are specifically for workstation users, enterprise users, and so on. So the exact configuration of the Vega 20 GPU in the Radeon 7 is the same as it is in the Radeon Instinct MI50, the lower tier workstation card. And this means it has 60 compute units instead of the full 64 enabled, which are actually on the die itself. Now the two cards aren't exactly the same. There are some differences because of the different audiences that they're targeting. So the key ones to remember are the Instinct card it moves up to PCI Express 4, but that's irrelevant in the gaming space. So we're back down to PCIe 3.0. And the other one is that the floating point 64 performance, also known as double precision, is running at one eighth the rate instead of one half the rate, which you would get on the workstation card. So when you shrink the process node of a GPU as AMD has done here, often what you're able to do is push the frequencies higher whilst retaining the same power envelope. And that's exactly what we see here. So Radeon 7 has a 300 watt power envelope compared to 295 watt on Vega 64, so pretty much the same. But the boost frequency, which is probably what you'll see in games, has gone up from about 1.55 gigahertz to 1.75 gigahertz. So a nice little boost there. Part of the benefit of the uh, process node shrink is that the die size has gone down, which you'll be able to see on this dummy die over here. And this has allowed for two more HBM2 memory stacks to be implemented given the card a total of 16 gigabytes for its frame buffer. You may remember that uh, Nvidia's RTX 2080 Ti, which is, is a flagship part, that only has, I say only, has 11 gigabytes. So it's a pretty big difference. Now AMD in its pre-briefing materials has made a big deal about this, you know, saying uh, games are getting more and more demanding, but a game that fills up a buffer isn't necessarily a game that needs to do that. A lot of the engines will fill buffer if it's available, but there isn't a huge performance benefit to doing so. So it'll be interesting to see if the results actually show that there's a huge benefit to having 16 gigabytes at the higher resolutions. Similarly with the memory bandwidth, AMD has more than doubled what's available, but much like the frame buffer being 16 gigabyte, we're not sure yet whether one terabyte per second is really needed on a gaming GPU. It does seem that AMD has taken the easiest route in taking the MI50 and turning it into a gaming card. And they may be, there may be trade-offs that they could have done otherwise, but this was probably the most cost-effective solution. So the card itself, you may remember from the unboxing video we did, uh, is this rather good looking card. It's probably AMD's best looking and best built card they've ever done. Fits the standard dual slot form factor. It's about 267 millimeters long and it's slightly taller than the PCI bracket at about 120 millimeters tall. For the launch, AMD will only be producing these cards and its partners will be able to rebrand them, but we're not expecting to see custom callers anytime soon, maybe within the next few months, but we haven't really had any details confirmed. So this is the card you'll be getting if you do buy the AMD Radeon 7. So we have two 8-pin connectors on the, along the top edge, and we've got three display ports and one HDMI. And remember, this card will support AMD's FreeSync 2 HDR. The cooler has been given a bit of an upgrade from Vega 64. They're still using vapor chamber cooling, which is a pretty efficient means of using the space they have available. Uh, that feeds an aluminium fin stack, but this time it's cooled by three fans instead of the one radial fan from before. 
So the structure of the aluminium fins, the direction, means that the heat is going to be exhausted predominantly out of the top and the bottom of the card. So a lot of that's going to be going towards your motherboard. Now this isn't ideal, but it is kind of the norm now for high-end cards. It's what NVIDIA does with its own RTX Founders Edition cards. Uh, other things to note, we have a red Radeon logo in a little corner here, both of which will illuminate red. We don't see a secondary BIOS on this card. That's something that AMD had on Vega, but hasn't seemed necessary to do with this one. So you'll just have one BIOS with all your settings fixed as they are. And lastly, we get a metal backplate with some nice perforation on, and this should help cooling as well as looking a little bit better than a bare PCB. Obviously, the big question when it comes to performance is how the Radeon 7 performs next to the RTX 2080. What we can say from our benchmarks is that the RTX 2080 does take the lead, but only by a little bit. It's about 4% ahead on average. Furthermore, the average does disguise quite big differences. These are two very different cards with different architectures, and therefore they respond very differently to different APIs and different engines within each game, as well as different optimizations. So the 4% figure really does cover a quite big difference in terms of from game to game. For example, uh, you will see our World of Tanks benchmark at 1080p running 20% faster on the RTX 2080, which may seem quite damning. But on the other hand, if you take a game like Deus Ex at 4K, you're going to see an 11% lead for AMD. So again, it's quite a lot of difference and it's important to look at the, the games and the resolution that are most important to you. So taking it resolution by resolution, we'll start with 1080p and as expected, you know, with 2080-esque performance, this card isn't going to struggle at 1080p. For example, in a game like Battlefield 1, which a little bit old but still very demanding, we're seeing an average frame rate of over 120 FPS, so it makes it a great candidate for a high refresh rate monitor if you wanted to stick to 1080p. 1440p, meanwhile, is what we would consider the optimum resolution for this card in terms of balancing image quality and performance. So for example, we see average frame rates of over 60 FPS in all of our tests. And even in a game as demanding as Deus Ex, for example, the minimum frame rate is still hitting that 60 FPS, albeit just, but that's a really good result as well. And finally at 4K, which is our most demanding resolution, the card tends to get between 30 and 60 FPS on average. So not quite as high as 1440p, but again, that's to be expected. And, you know, some good results there as well. We see a 30 FPS minimum in Total War Warhammer 2. And this is actually a game where AMD has a little advantage over a uh, NVIDIA because NVIDIA's drivers at the moment for some reason are causing a little bit of stutter, which you, so you'll see minimum frame rates are a bit lower as well. But with AMD, it's nice and consistent. So in terms of wider comparisons with other cards on the market, 2080 Ti naturally is still king, uh, comfortably ahead by around 27% on average we found. Uh, compared to a 2070 below, we're looking at around 18% lead for AMD's new card. And we also see a 28% lead over Vega 64 on average, so it's a nice little bump up. I think also something that's a bit more interesting about the comparison to Vega 64 is obviously we mentioned earlier that the memory and memory bandwidth have gone up substantially. And traditionally you'd expect that to uh, pay off when it gets to the higher resolutions. Uh, Vega 64 is obviously the most direct comparison in terms of architecture and actually that is where we see the greatest scaling as you move up the resolution. So for example we see it's about 26% faster than this on average at 1080p but you go up to 4k and you're looking around 35% on average. So it does seem that the you know the extra memory and bandwidth is flexing its muscles where it can but whether that's enough scaling to justify the cost of implementing so much of it remains to be seen. So AMD's given NVIDIA a pretty good run for its money in terms of performance, but power is one of the areas that AMD has struggled with consistently, especially with the Vega architecture. And sadly, that hasn't gone away. We didn't really expect it to. So while moving to 7 nanometer has improved power consumption relative to Vega 64, we're still seeing a 50 watt difference between Radeon 7 and RTX 2080, and that, that is pretty substantial. When you have greater power consumption in a form factor that is largely similar and using similar cooling, one thing is going to give, and it's going to be temperature or noise, or a combination of both. Now in this case, AMD has, is running the card rather cool. We're seeing pretty similar temperatures between the two cards, so there's nothing to really complain about in terms of the operating temperature. 
And that means that unfortunately the thing that has given is noise. The card thankfully isn't quite as loud as the Vega 64 was, but we are seeing these three little fans spinning at around 3000 RPM and it does kick out a bit of a whine. It, it's very much more noticeable than the little RTX 2080 here. Now personally, I think this decision was made by AMD in order to maintain uh, the boost speeds. The card does actually do this very well. It's rated for about 1750 megahertz and we saw averages of around 1760 even after prolonged load. So the low temperature does at least allow the boost to stay high and performance will remain consistent as a result. But yeah, the, the noise, the comparison is hands down Nvidia winning that one. So that about wraps up the general performance summary at, at stock speeds. But you know, this being BitTech, we wanted to overclock the card, see if we could push it any harder. And unfortunately we just couldn't. Uh, we're not really sure what's gone on, but it feels like there's been a bit of a rush in terms of getting the drivers out for release because no matter what we did in Radian Watman, we just couldn't get settings to stick. We couldn't really get any of our manual overclocking efforts to work. And furthermore, extra tools like MSI Afterburner just weren't working either. GPU Z wasn't reporting properly, so they, they need to do a bit of tweaking in terms of getting the API all there and so on. One thing that we were able to do is use the automatic overclock tool in Radian Watman. It's a bit confusing the way it works. You click it and then the screen goes gray because it's doing everything in the background, but you don't know when it's working or anything. You just kind of have to start a game and, and measure the performance. Um, we, we did see slightly higher clock speeds by doing this, but I mean, we're talking maybe 30 megahertz or so, and consequently performance was one, two, three percent more, not a lot. And even worse, the fans go even louder at this point. So the, the card is obviously trying to increase that thermal headroom to give you that little boost, but it just means that the, the fans are spinning even louder and it's not something that we imagine many of you would want to do. We also tried doing the automatic memory overclocking and that crashed our game. So again, we're just gonna have to wait and see whether AMD can deliver some more stable drivers in terms of overclocking before we can really do much with the card beyond that. One thing I will add to the overclocking bit just quickly is the, the fact that the automatic overclocking is kind of determined to increase that thermal headroom does suggest that if you were able to fit a better cooler, for example, water cooling to the card, you might have a bit more luck with overclocking, but we don't really know what partners are gonna be delivering in terms of uh, water blocks, so we're just going to have to wait and see there as well. So wrapping up, it's easy to be cynical in a situation like this. You know, we could just say, oh, AMD's just taken the instant cards that didn't make the cut, slapped a new cooler on it and marketed it towards gamers. Now we are cynical and we did just say that, but there is more nuance to it, you know, and we, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't go through that. So the good news is AMD now finally does have a proper 4K gaming card, which has been missing until now, and it is also finally giving Nvidia a little bit of competition at the high end. So the Radeon 7 is a match for the RTX 2080 in terms of base level performance, but it gets there at the cost of power and thermals to a degree which are a bit too high in our opinion. And furthermore, the overclockability is considerably less based on our experience. I mean, we couldn't even get it working, but even AMD's own figures suggest that you're only going to get about three to 5%, whereas the 2080 can be pushed a bit further than that. And also if you're doing it on the Radeon 7, you're gonna sacrifice power and thermals even more. Uh, now to its credit, AMD does have a much larger memory pool and memory bandwidth than anything else on the market right now. But equally, Nvidia has its real-time ray tracing and its uh, AI enhanced visuals to counter that. And it kind of remains to be seen which of those is gonna play out and become more valuable in the long term. Similarly, looking long-term, Nvidia has weakened AMD's position on the variable refresh rate position as well because it now supports FreeSync, but how well that works is still kind of playing out as well, so we don't want to make too many firm judgments there either. Even so, I think it would have been interesting, well more interesting, if AMD had come out with a sort of three-quarter memory approach, so if it had a 12 gigabyte frame buffer and a 750 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, it would be interesting to see if that actually affected the performance numbers at all. We did kind of try to test this by underclocking the memory, but as we know, the overclocking software wasn't really working so we, not, we have to kind of wait to see whether we can do that or not. And on that note it does feel like this card has been rushed a little bit. We're not used to seeing drivers that can't really overclock at all but uh, our guess is that someone in Radeon marketing just couldn't resist launching the 7 nanometer Radeon 7 for $700 on February 7th. So we're left with what we have but hopefully the overclocking will improve as time goes on.
So going by the $700 price tag that we've been given, that puts the Radeon 7 in line with basic RTX 2080 cards, although these still have decent coolers attached to them. You're not looking at blower style, so should be some pretty good cooling from those 2080s. Now at that price, because of the issues we experience with power and noise and overclocking on the Radeon 7, we're not really rec ready to recommend it against competing 2080 cards. But it is important to remember that the raw performance is there. So I think if the card could come down by say 50 to $100, AMD would have like a really competitive card on its hands. But you'd, you'd have to still be living with that noise and that's going to come down to user preference. That also opens the door for aftermarket cooling to come in, but hopefully that doesn't come at too high a cost. And like I said before, we still don't really know if or when that's going to arrive, but that would make Radeon 7 a lot more interesting if you can get that noise down either via a better air cooler or via water cooling. So one thing we haven't touched on are the game bundles currently available with the two cards. With the RTX 2080, you're looking at getting Battlefield 5 and Anthem. And with the Radeon 7, it will be Resident Evil 2, Devil May Cry 5, and The Division 2. Uh, we don't tend to put much value on these because the value of each game is going to depend on you and whether you like them, but that's the information, so there it is. But the main thing for us is that the, the card is going to need a price cut in order to be truly competitive, and until then, we'd recommend holding off. So that brings our first video graphics card review to a close. I do recommend you go check out the written one. There's a lot more information on the technical side, and you can also go through the individual results at your own leisure. But either way, do give us your feedback. We are looking to improve these as much as we can. And if you did like it, please give us a like, a subscribe and all that. It really helps out. And with that, I'll see you next time.